Turn it around, <laughs> yes, there we go, I turned the camera around the wrong way again, but there we go, Selena is here straight away, good evening, Selena, um, I shouted a bit loud then, didn't I, it's Friday night folks, it's good Friday, let's turn this into a great Friday, Vishal, somebody else joined, I missed you, um, good evening, um, yeah, let's turn this into a great Friday, um, welcome to Book Club, for those who don't know me, my name is Ross, I'm an actor and a voiceover artist from here, uh, from here, from Manchester, that's here, um, and I go three times a week, once on a Monday, once on a Wednesday, once on a Friday, Helen Power, she's got the power, she's here, I always do that, because it's just weird, she's got a great surname, Helen Power, thanks for sharing that on Twitter before, Helen, Cindy Bella's here as well, thanks for sharing, um, and yeah, Monday and Wednesday we do something called Motivation and Mind Hacks, which is exactly what it sounds like, it's little hacks that you can put into your life to help you get more motivated, get more pro uh, like productive, um, help you with your physicality, your emotional mastery, your spirituality, all kind of areas in your life to help you get further faster. On a Friday, we do something a bit different. We do book club where we take one book a month and we look at it for um, for that entire month. We look at it for the four Fridays of that month and uh, it's generally a book on personal development, personal change. Um, again, things that are going to help you um, in your life. Just experience more success. Cap, good evening. Thank you for uh, sharing the scope. For the last three Fridays, we have looked at Michael Port's and steal the show. Michael is an actor, but you don't. he's written a book for non-actors, so you don't have to be an actor to get any of this stuff, by the way. I know a lot of actors watch these scopes, but if you're not an actor, you're still gonna get this. Um, and Michael is uh, an actor turned public speaker, turned public speaking coach. Um, coaches some uh, the you know the biggest names in the in the world really on public speaking. Um, he's an awesome guy. Sam, good evening. Girly Whirly, missed somebody else there who came in, but good thanks for joining us. Um, and he wrote uh, Steal the Show, yeah, which is a uh, a book. Well, it tells you here from speeches to job interviews to deal closing pitches, how to guarantee a standing ovation for all the performances in your life. And it's literally a book that takes a lot of um, stuff that we know as performers that we do in our lives as performers when we're working. Um, but it teaches kind of people who are not performers to implement those skills into their everyday lives, which I think as performers sometimes we can forget to do. So we have all these skills at our disposal when we're working on set or in the theatre, and then suddenly sometimes in social situations or you know professional situations, people forget to use these skills that they've got and they've trained so hard to acquire um, to actually use them in everyday life. So today we're looking at the last the last section I can look at. This is week four of four. If you want to read the rest of the book, get to, get to Amazon and get it. It's about fifteen pounds, uh, but it's great, really, really good book. Uh, we're going to look at a principle, one of Michael's performance principles, called yes and. Now, for those who are actors, you're going to totally get this, and I just really want to remind you, and you're going to you're going to resonate with everything we talk about tonight. If you are a performer who's been in an improvisation situation as an actor on a stage or in an audition, and you've been paired with somebody who hasn't played ball, okay, so has closed you down and hasn't said yes and, but as you know, you, you've walked in and gone, oh, I've, I've broken my leg, and they go, no, you haven't. <laughs> you go, oh, God, like, I don't, don't know what to do. You just kind of, you know, they're just uh, I'm getting the thumbs up off cat. Um, yeah, you know, they're hard work, and, um, and sometimes, we do this in real life, we close ourselves down by saying no to the improvisation of life. And really we should be saying yes and to a lot more. Now this, this complements a lot of the scopes I've done in the past. Um, and I don't want, I still don't want people to say yes. I don't subscribe, subscribe to the idea of saying yes to everything in order to say no to yourself sometimes. I want you to start saying yes and more to life, but more to yourself above anything. Don't say yes to someone else if it means saying no to yourself. So bear that in mind as we read tonight's uh, chapter. Six and a half pages. It's not going to take us that long. Who's had Easter eggs yet for Easter? Go, get yourself some chocolate and settle in. I, uh, I've been bought a big box of uh, green and blacks, like, like a green and black selection box. It's quite amazing. I've had about three bars already. Carl, good evening. Good to see you. Um, I, had, I had chocolate for the first time today talking about green and blacks. We're going off topic. But I had it with sea salt in it. Have you ever had chocolate and sea salt? Green and black sea salt flavoured chocolate. It's like, it's pretty sweet. Well, it's sweet and it's savoury because it's got salt in it. No, no chockey for me, only cold showers. I'm going to check in with people because we're nearly at the end of the two week cold shower challenge. If you've never watched the Periscope of mine before, you'll have no clue what we're talking about. But two weeks ago, this Monday, this coming Monday, we set the two week cold shower challenge where you have a two minute cold shower at the end of your warm shower every day because it's got loads of benefits. Um, Selena, how are you getting on? Let's talk at the end about that, but um, I've done it every day, and it's, it's good, isn't it? It's like, it's just part of what I do now, and it's not as, 
it's nowhere near as bad now as it was like you know 10 days ago when we started try chocky with chili interesting i've not had chocolate and chili i'm not i'm a bit of a wimp when it comes to spices though um who was that miranda's joined i am miranda good to see you right so we're reading this chapter yes and um the first bit's great you, you're all going to get this particularly the performers here are going to get it but everyone's going to get this michael starts off and he says we all know that famous saying the show must go on we've all heard that as performers performers and just everyone in life said that he says, well, here's the rub about that old chestnut. The show never goes on when you say no in any area of life. So that's pretty straightforward. The show never goes on when you say no in any area of your life. Whatever the personal relationships among the cast members, um, when they're rehearsing and performing, actors and performers, creative artists, inventors, visionaries, they thrive on the power of saying yes. Saying yes and not only improves the writing and rehearsal process, but it makes meetings more effective. It helps persuade your spouse or partner during a difficult conversation. And it gives you a new confidence for networking and winning the room. Yes, and we do this in Impro at Actor Tribe. Awesome, Carl, you'll get this then. So, so Michael says, in her book, Bossy Pants, which I've not heard of and I've not looked at, but maybe we should check it out. In, in her book, Bossy Pants, um, and in many interviews, Tina Fey, she's an actress, Tina Fey, um, of Saturday Night Live and 30 Rock fame. She's explained the importance of saying yes in her work and then figuring out how to do what she agreed to later. So whatever the problem, be part of the solution, she writes. Don't just sit around raising questions and pointing out obstacles. Know the distinction between saying yes and giving lip service. Saying yes is about having the mindfulness to recognize and to respond positively to the content and feeling of another person's thoughts in conversation in real time. Saying yes and is about a leap of faith where you give your attention to what others offer, trusting that you'll know what to do next. So Richard Branson's got a really famous saying where he says, if you, if, if you get given an opportunity and you don't know how to do it, say yes and figure it out along the way. So I don't know if, if you've ever done that before where you've taken on something or someone's given you a job opportunity and you've gone, oh my God, I don't actually think I might be qualified <laughs> to do this, but I can't say no because this is a brilliant opportunity. So I have to say yes and, and just you know figure it out as I go. There's a big school of impro in the US and they show this on YouTube examples. Ah, okay, Carl, awesome. Well, find, find a link for us and put it in the Facebook group. That'd be really helpful. Fanny says, yes, yes, yes. And um, yeah, take that opportunity say yes and and figure it out this applies to my morning routine alarm goes off and i go yes and five more minutes on snooze i don't know, I don't know if that counts sam unfortunately uh, but that's the first bit yeah the first bit is saying you know when you say yes don't just it's not just lip service don't just say yeah for the sake of saying yeah and then you don't follow up on anything say yes with the faith you know that you're going to be able to do it and you take the opportunity and you run with it so we're going to go through the three dangers of saying no now and then we're going to look at the science behind saying yes and what it can bring to you and your success in your life so th there's three dangers the first danger of saying no is shutting down your creativity like instantly when you say no you just shut down your creativity okay so say so michael says let's say you and i are doing an improv scene for an audience and you come on a stage limping this is where i got this thing from before clearly in a lot of pain, shouting, I've broken my leg, right? And I respond by saying, no, you haven't. Well, suddenly the forward momentum stops, okay? However, if I responded by saying, oh my goodness, that's terrible, but your hair looks fabulous. Did you do something different with it? <laughs> now we're on to something because I framed my reaction by saying yes and you'd be able to respond in many different ways. One of which would be, really, do you think so? I was at the hair salon and the stylist used so many chemicals that I passed out, fell out of the chair, and that's how I broke my leg. Bit far-fetched, but maybe. This principle doesn't apply solely to improv, um, and Michael will explain this later in chapter 14, which we haven't read, and I'm not going to get time to read, so get the book if you want to read chapter 14. So as a strategic tactic, saying yes and helps us to look at creativity, collaboration, and problem solving as a way to maintain momentum regardless of the negativity or problems that come our way. So 
we've all had that, like I said at the start, we've all had that where someone has said no, you know, or, or just instantly just shot something down if it isn't an improvisation or, you know, in any part of your life, some, you know, somebody might have done that. And it instantly just diminishes your creativity. It's just going to sap the life out of you as well because it's like, oh, I thought I'd, I had a really good idea. Or you might have a great idea where this improvisation could be going to. And you just need somebody to say, yeah, it's like, it's like a joke, isn't it? It's like someone saying knock, knock, and you not going, who's there? Knock, knock, what? I need to say who's there. You know, it just doesn't, it just stops everything in its tracks. So that's danger number one. It's going to shut down your creativity. So write that down. If I say no, I am shutting down my create, my, can't even say it, my creativity. Danger number two, right, is you are discouraging audience participation. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean your audience is a performer, but the people around you. So let's look at that. So Michael says, how does this tactic apply to performance? Or public speaking. Well, one best selling author had finished his speech and was taking questions. An audience member asked, How can I meet the most relevant people at this event? The speaker didn't like the question because, rightly so, he thinks everybody is relevant. However, he then humiliated this poor guy by telling him so in front of thousands of people. So the energy in the room deflated as the audience members suddenly realized that they too could be ridiculed. So after that, only a few more people mustered the courage to ask a question. And I'm sure many people left with an enduring negative impression of a bullying moment rather than appreciating the good advice that was present inside, um, inside the no. So he did say no, but there was good advice inside that no that surrounded the answer to the question. So he says a more helpful approach might have been to bridge from his question by reframing it. So he could have said, thanks so much for your question. Yeah, it reminds me, everyone here is relevant. So I'd recommend spending as much time as you can networking because you never know how one relationship can open the door to another. The author could then pivot and offer advice on how to meet people. The simple reframe would have recognized the individual asking the question and also serve the audience. The point is, there's always a way to turn a potentially negative situation into a positive forum by using the yes and technique. So yes, it does take a little time and forethought to do this, but it can and should be done, especially if you're eager for a warm reception at the end of your talk. So that's just in life in general. Sometimes, God, I mean, look what we had on this Periscope the other night, a load of mentalists, didn't we? I don't know if you watched that scope from Monday, go and watch the replay on actonthis.tv if you didn't. We had like 300 crazy people on here all shouting negative stuff because they were just trolling the scope. Um, but ultimately, you know, I hope I tried to turn it into a positive, you know, and use it as entertainment and use it to kind of at least deliver a positive message by going, you know, look guys, you're wasting like so much of your time doing this. Let's look at other ways you could be spending your time to have a better life. Um, and you'll find that in dealing with people, I always find that is such a Ross Grant paragraph about people and positivity. I love it, Sam. Um, you'll find managing people, I don't know how you go about like influencing people, but in my life, I'm, I, I, I talk to people very differently in order to get the best out of them. And some people, you know, you have to manage them, you know, you have to kind of tiptoe around them a little bit more and you have to kind of big them up a bit more and, and make things appear as if they were their idea in order for them to engage with you and you know and, and get momentum up and, and be positive. Other people are like that naturally. Um, but you have a you have a choice when somebody gives you a negative response. You could be negative as well, which is you go at loggerheads together and then you get both get nowhere. Um, or you flip that and, and you tell you kind of give them the answer um, and you reframe what they said in a way that you show them how they should have maybe said it. Um, but you make them think that it was it was their idea kind of thing, and that's what that's what Michael's saying there. You know, if a guy puts up his hand and says something that is quite negative, he's at an event saying, "I only want to talk to relevant people here. How do I m meet the most relevant people?" And you're going, "Well, it's a bit of a backhanded comment that because you've just basically just said that 90% of the people in the room aren't relevant." But the speaker then has the ability to to flip that guy's comment, reframe it, say yes and, and turn a, a negative into a positive, really. Um, so that's the second danger. You, um, first danger was uh, you shut down creativity. The second was you discourage audience participation. So if you hit back at someone negatively, other people around might not want to put their hand up and talk. You know, if you, someone wrote a question on here that I thought was, was stupid, not that there are any stupid questions, remember, only the questions you don't ask. Um, and I, um, 
and I ridiculed you on a scope, then no one else is gonna is gonna want to type in, are they? So that would be pointless. I don't do that. I just say yes and. Carl said he uses yes and on what, Carl? On Act on this TV, the website. Um, I can't. I didn't. I missed your comment, Carl. Say it again. But thanks anyway. Anything you're doing that's that's yes and for Act on this is is a bonus for me. So thank you. So that's the second one. Second one was uh, audience engagement. By saying no, you're discouraging audience engagement. Okay, um, the first one was you shut down creativity. Now the third no is you actually prevent creative dialogue. Okay, so let's have a look at this. If there's a person in your workplace meetings or teams who like to take the role of the devil's advocate, and we looked at the role of the devil's advocate on Wednesday, you need a devil's advocate in your life and you need to play this role but you don't want to play it in a negative way. I added it to act on this, yes, and link. Ah, awesome, Carl, nice one, good stuff. Um, so yeah, you need a devil's advocate, but you need to be careful with how you play it or how people around you are playing it. So, so Michael says, you know how this works. As the meeting develops, a colleague puts forth a suggestion or initiative. Invariably, the devil's advocate plays his part, which is fine, because you know you should look, be, do, you know, be diligent, do your due diligence, say, is this the right thing to do? But don't kibosh an idea straight away. So the, the uh, devil advocate plays his part just to be the devil's advocate. He begins, here's why that won't work, or Gary in accounting won't go for it, and so on and so on. What's inevitable is he shuts people down, slows down the positive flow, doesn't bridge to the workable aspects of the idea, but continues to poke holes in it. So that's the key. A devil's advocate needs to bridge the workable aspects of the idea. So if someone's got an idea, don't just say no to it straight away if you know if you don't think it's gonna work. Look at what part of it might work and play that part as a devil's advocate. So, so in fact the devil's advocate loves to poke holes in things and even relishes the role. The devil's advocate justifies his advocacy with statements such as we can't take off with a half-baked idea. The truth is just as there are no fully baked cakes that don't pass through a half-baked stage the same applies to ideas. I'll say that again, it's a bit common, isn't it? The truth is, just as there are no fully baked cakes that don't pass through a half-baked stage, the same applies to ideas. So for a cake to become fully baked, it has to pass through the half-baked stage. So if your idea is only half-baked, that's totally cool because it has to pass that point to become fully baked. So don't let a devil's advocate shoot you down straight away and quash the half-baked stage of your idea. <laughs> if you get that, it's quite complex, isn't it? But he says the deeper truth is that your colleague is saying no far too many times. So monitor these kind of conversations as I have and you'll notice how quickly the overall productive and collaborative discussions will die off as the meeting leader moves on to the next routine topic. So have you ever been there? in that situation where you've been trying to work something out and somebody, no matter what you say in your group, is just brick walling it all the time, kiboshing it, and you don't, you know, you can't really work with those people. Um, I love it when I get together with a group of people in business or something, so my web developer, great guy called Hugo, I've mentioned him quite a lot, he'll have some ideas for a development on the website, there's a few websites that I run, might not be exactly what I want, but then it'll bounce an idea so that I then go, oh, well, what about this? And he goes, oh, well, how do we build on that? And we, you know, we all get it. What's that? You're baking us all a cake, says Sam. No, I'm not, Sam. My cooking skills are not very good, but I am very open to anyone else on the scope baking me cake, because I love cake. Um, so yeah, bouncing ideas off, off each other. And that's what's great about having a mastermind like this, like the scope that we've got and in the Facebook groups that we've got. Come and join the group if you're not a member, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash act on this TV. Um, is we can bounce these half-baked ideas off each other. So together, combined, we become the oven, kids. It's a nice little uh, analogy there to, uh, to bake our cakes to the fully baked stage. So they're the, um, the three big dangers of saying no. First up is you shut down creativity. Second up is you discourage audience engagement. Nobody wants to raise their hand because you just say no to everything. And you prevent creative dialogue. So let's have a look at saying yes and um, and where you should say it and how it actually uh, how it affects you. So we've got another three sections of say why you should say yes. So it says if you have 15 minutes to spare, write this down because I'm I'm going to do this as well. But I've never I've not heard of this guy. Listen to Michael Massimino's and that's spelled M A S S I M I N O. Michael Massimino, M A S S. I M 
I N O. Listen to an audio story um, of his produced by the non profit storytelling organization. It's called The Moth, right? And um, so, Michael Massimino, The Moth. There you go. That's, that's correct, Selena. You've got it. Uh, yeah, Massimino, or I'd probably say it wrong, probably Massimino, or something like that. But check that out, the moth, okay? So Michael says, look at that. Um, Massimino, or Massimino, or whatever, is an M MIT trained astronaut who was assigned to take a spacewalk to fix one of the Hubble Space Telescope's most valuable and delicate technologies, a spectrograph that detects whether atmospheres on far off planets in other solar systems could support life. So it's a pretty expensive piece of kit, this, right? Talk about pressure. Okay, so Massimino, working with another astronaut who is inside the shuttle, examines the sensor, which was designed to be tamper proof in a rocket scientist kind of way. His fellow astronaut talks him through different solutions as one idea after another fails. But they never say no. So not only they're working with like an incredibly expensive tamper-proof piece of equipment, everything they're doing is failing, and yet they're not saying no to this, okay? Massimino observed, I was beginning to feel pretty alone. And I don't mean sitting in a chair by yourself on a Sunday afternoon wearing your slippers and reading the newspaper alone, right? The two astronauts have the fate of the Hubble Space Telescope in their hands, and they keep saying yes and to one more idea and one more thought and another idea and one more thought and one more approach until the sensor is fixed. Finally, Massimino enjoys a moment watching Earth hanging amidst all of the terrifyingly beautiful grandeur of space from outside the shuttle. So he sits back, God, I fixed it. We didn't say no, we kept saying yes. And now he just gets to look at Earth floating in this mass black of space, knowing he's done a good job. Um, so that's the um, that's the the first the first place you should start saying yes and is when the stakes are high. So when the stakes are the highest, you need to start saying yes and. Okay, if those guys had said no, you know, because the stakes were too high, wouldn't have worked. The second place you need to start saying yes and. It, uh, well, I'll tell you once I've read this little section actually. Let's let's see if you can figure it out. Saying yes and is key to the way many of our greatest entrepreneurs think and work. Google executive chairman Eric Schmidt said in a much admired speech to UC uh, Berkeley graduates in 2012, even if it's a bit edgy, a bit out of your comfort zone, say yes. Saying yes means that you'll do something new. You'll meet new people and make a difference in your life and likely in others' lives as well. Um, yes, let's, um, l yes lets you stand out in a crowd, to be the optimist, to stay positive, to be the one everyone comes to for help, for advice, or just for fun. Yes is what keeps us all young. Yes is a tiny word that can do big things, so say it often. Um, so, uh, so he says, how yes and works for you at work. So in any aspect of your work, when you're feeling uncomfortable, even if it's a bit edgy, say yes and. It's likely to lead to an experience in your life and an impact on others as well. So last thing we're gonna look at is the neuroscience behind saying yes and. And actually the, the science behind this, how it's gonna make you actually feel better. It's like a tonic for your soul. So saying yes and, is also confirmed by science as a tonic for your soul, your brain, and your productivity. I won't get too technical, Michael says, but if you haven't heard, and you guys have, because I mention it all the time, if you haven't heard about negativity bias, it's a pretty interesting concept. Experts in neuroscience write about this frequently. Love a bit of neuroscience, says Kim. Well, experts in neuroscience write about this frequently, Kim. They say that the brain evolved millions of years ago when human beings could become a meal for a lion or a saber-toothed tiger, or be easily overrun by marauding tribes. Survival required noticing the faintest signals of danger in our environment. As a result, our brains tend to have greater memories, stronger initial reactions, and more stickiness, excuse me, for the kind of nose and pushbacks that are common in an office workplace and in business and life in general. 
The parts of our brains that fear serious mayhem are easily triggered by small stuff, such as the boss shooting down your idea in a meeting, dinging your tribal status in front of your peers. As neuroscientist and author Rick Hansen has written, we continually look for negative information. We overreact to it, totally true. And then we quickly store these reactions in brain structure. For example, we learn faster from pain. This is really interesting, guys. You, you need to know this. You learn faster from pain than you do from pleasure. And you learn faster from negative interactions um, and impact they have on your relationship than positive ones. That's why when you're in a relationship with your significant other or anybody and everything's going well and you're kind of just sailing along, you might not necessarily appreciate the positives there until something really goes wrong and you have a negative, like an argument, and then it's like all oh, hell breaks loose. My brain is a constant mess of creativity, says Sam. Um, but it's just interesting to remember that you know you, um, you learn far quicker from pain than you do from pleasure. So it w requires you to do pleasurable things way more often in order to learn, you know, whereas you only have to do something wrong once and you've learned from it. Okay, so uh, so do, do pleasurable things as often as you can. Um, so he says, for example, yeah, we learn faster from pain than pleasure, and negative interactions have more impact on a relationship than positive ones. In effect, our brain is like Velcro for the bad, but Teflon for the good. No, a few a couple of my friends are like what they call relationship gurus, um, and they've said many times to me. They say, you know, when you're in a relationship, apparently, uh, bring on the pleasure, says Miranda. Um, apparently. Um, in a relationship, here's one for you, for all you guys in relationships. For every one negative interaction with your significant other, you need, if, if you have one negative interaction, you need four positive interactions to balance it out. So you can't just offset one negative impact on a relationship, one negative, like one argument with one positive experience. You need four positive experiences for every one negative you have for your relationship to grow and flourish. And if it isn't growing, guys, it's dying. We know that. If they listen, says Scott. But yeah, no, it's, um, it's true. I've read lots and lots on that. Um, a few of my mates do, do a lot of uh, coaching on, uh, on relationships and stuff. And uh, yeah, you'll need four positive interactions for every one negative one. And that's why uh, people, when they get kind of stuck in a bit of a rut with a the relationship, they don't, when we first meet someone who are wooing, Think about all the things at the start of your relationship you do to win that person over. You're constantly doing things to impress them, to make them like you, you know, to have a positive impact on their life. And then when you get together a few months in, you stop doing that stuff. And it's when you stop doing that stuff, that four to one effectively, um, you know, four positive interactions, it's when things start going wrong. So if you're in a relationship, do four things this Easter weekend on this four day bank holiday weekend. Um, to, to enable your relationship to grow. Wooing, loving it, Sam. You've got to have a bit of wooing in your life, haven't you? Um, so, uh, where were we up to? Well, we've got a couple of paragraphs left, guys. Um, so remember, yeah, he said our brain is like Velcro for the bad, but it's like Teflon for the good. So the good just flows off it, all the bad sticks. That's Velcro, that's the uh, international sign language of Velcro. Um, because our brains have this almost telepathic paranoia, for criticism and threat. Scientists and neuroleadership experts such as David Rock have written about the importance of avoiding the brain's threat radar in managing and motivating people, including yourself, so to give their best performance. Performers know this apparently intuitively, but do you, as a performance, do you know this intuitively? When people encounter a stimulus, this is how it works, Rock has written, their brain will either tag the stimulus as good and engage in the stimulus, so approach it, or their brain will tag the stimulus as bad and disengage from the stimulus, so avoid it. If a stimulus is associated with positive emotions or rewards, it will likely lead to an approach response. If it is associated with negative emotions or punishments, it will likely lead to an avoid response. Numerous studies show that the engagement we get from focusing on the approach response has positive effects on decision making, stress management, collaboration and motivation. Or as Rock says, people learn best when they are interested in something. Interest is an approach state. So saying yes and is actually an approach trigger. 
It begins the positive cycle of creative, productive problem solving. Saying yes and isn't about giving yourself permission to say or do whatever crosses your mind, but it is about giving yourself permission to explore and experiment to improve your ideas by finding out what works and what doesn't. As I'll show you in part three, which we don't get to read unfortunately unless you buy the book, writing and rehearsing for your spotlight moments can be messy and you need to say yes and to your own talent so it can find its way. If you really want to take the first step to becoming an outstanding speaker and performer, then get accustomed to saying yes. Uh, it's as simple as that. So like I said, it's not carte blanche to say yes to everything just for the sake of saying yes and so you can go and do whatever you want. Go, I've got to say yes to everything because I can just do what I want. It's not. It's about picking your moments. Um, but it's about saying yes and to yourself and to your talent above all. Kind of related to performance like punch drunk and installation interactive performance. Not really, not really been to any interactive performance for years, Sam, to be honest with you. I, I kind of stay away from that a little bit. Again, but that again depends on the performers, doesn't it? If the performers are saying yes and to the audience and not ridiculing people or making fun of them, you know, like at a comedy store where you just get ripped apart. <laughs> Sometimes you just, you don't want to go to the toilet, do you? Because like, God, if I stand up, I'm going to get picked on. He's going to see me, he's going to see me. Whereas if it's, uh, you know, if the performance is a bit more inclusive and it's a bit, I don't know, a bit more jovial or whatever, you don't mind kind of getting involved if, they, you know, if they're saying yes and to the audience, they're not just shooting people down. Um, but yeah, I just really like that at the end where he says, you know, basically, um, You've got to, you know, you need to say yes and to your own talent for it to find its way. And a lot of actors don't do that because they either don't believe in it, don't believe they've got the talent, they don't believe they've got the potential. I need you to say yes and to your potential as well. And, to, and then you'll take the action to fulfill your potential. We say yes and so we don't block. Yeah, no, also, I mean, it is, people do use literally that phrase as an acting exercise. Um, you know, as opposed to, uh, you know, just, just standard improvisation. But I think you need to just be aware of it in your life. In general, when you're out tomorrow in public, are you saying no, shutting people down, or are you saying yes and? It's both ways. Basically, you're in a transformed warehouse and you can wander around. What is that, Sam? What you're doing that, or, or you mean that's just what installation interactive is in general? I've seen some weird installation interactive stuff where people like get like really part of like part of the performance and get shot and stuff. Not like with bullets, but <laughs> like bow and arrows and weird plunger things. A bit weird. Both performance and audience work on a yes and principle. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and the, and the audience need to be, you know, need to be engaged in that way with, um, you know, with the the performers, so that um, you know, just to watch and engage in the, you know, in the performance. Um, but yeah, I just thought it was quite interesting. You know, we 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 should be saying it as performers in our work, particularly in improvisation. But are you saying it in your life, into the improvisation of life? Um, and can you say it more? Do you find yourself backing off? and saying no because you're resisting stuff, so you're using all your willpower that you get such a tiny amount of on a daily basis. We get such a little amount of willpower every day and most people waste it resisting things and then they have none, they have none left for actually you know, saying yes to things. Um, so yeah, can you say yes in your life more? Let me know now. I mean, who, um, who thinks they, uh, they, they could engage more with new experiences? And not just for the sake of saying yes to just nonsense stuff you know it's not going to serve you. Don't go and waste your time saying yes to things that have absolutely no part in your life. You know, say yes to things that you actually want to do, but you might be afraid of doing. That's the thing. You know, I'd love to do a skydive and I'm just waiting. Well, no, I'd love to do it, but I'm petrified. But I'm waiting for somebody to force me into it for charity and I will say yes and. I've been so passionate about my beliefs lately. It's always yes. Good cat. Awesome. Um, definitely. So there's definitely things that I have backed away from because of fear. Like, oh, I don't want to jump out of a plane, but I know I'd, I know once I'd done it, I'd be like, right, there's another thing I can tick off. Um, but it is getting, you know, feeling that discomfort and, and becoming comfortable with it, I guess. Um, but yeah, that's something. Bungee jumping as well has fascinated me, but I'm like, oh God, I just don't know. I just don't know if I want to fly off a bridge on an elastic band. If you've done it, let me know, but it's pretty scary. Um, so, uh, so that's Steal the Show, kids. Ended up on a date said yes to it as a friend and realized it might be a date whilst on it. What? Ended up on a date, said yes to it as a friend, then realized it might be a date. I don't know what happened, Sam, but I'm guessing you went on a date. <laughs> um, let me know, have you been on it? And what was it like? Yes, and when you in to see us, Ross, at Tribe. Right, so I was gonna come into Actors Tribe tomorrow, Carl, 
But because it's Easter, um, Lee, Lee Boardman, for those who don't, who don't know what we're talking about, runs a great acting school called Actor Tribe. Lee's a fantastic actor himself. Carl is one of his students, so Sam. Uh, a few of the people on here, um, and I go in and do little kind of mindset things like this with the uh, with the group. I was going to go in tomorrow, Carl, but there could it be an Easter? A few people have said they're going to be away, so we're going to do it sometime next term. Um, but I want to do a whole session on goal setting because I don't think people really know in this industry what they want. Uh, I was looking forward to it. Oh no, cat! I was I was I was popping in tomorrow, but I needed more time. And he said there's a lot of people who have said they can't make it because um, it's Easter and they're going away for the weekend but we will do it next term um, but yeah I think a lot of people in the industry think you know they go what, I go what do you want they go I want a better acting career and I go you don't really know what you want then do you what do you actually want let's get super specific so I'm going to come in and do a whole goal setting thing with everybody ping your promise next term seriously don't know how you do them but I'll do it myself um, I'm definitely coming next term I love it I'm, I'm, I just I've got so much time for Lee um, the guy is just an amazing guy with a big heart been through a lot of stuff um, and uh, I've got all the time in the world for him, so yeah, no, I will uh, definitely come in. A friend just asked if they could come see some theatre with me. I said, yeah, sure. Ah, so Sam's going on theatre dates. Um, excellent, Sam. Good work. Uh, well, it'd be pretty classy. If he's saying, yeah, I want to go to the theatre, you know, hopefully he'll be all right. Um, even I think it ended up being a date. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, then I oh, then I think it ended up being a date. It was definitely a date, Sam. I think it was a date, definitely. Has he texted you back? Did you swap numbers? Um, if not, Tony Rossi is not on the scope tonight, but at Tony underscore Rossi, or I can't remember his, his Twitter name. He's in America, but he's well up for dates. Um, cheers, Carl. Carl says, you're great, Ross, and you're inspiration to me anyway. Boom. Well, likewise, I get like massive inspiration off you guys. Like, seriously. I say this all the time, it's not the Ross show, like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it if I didn't get something back from it. I love speaking to you guys. If someone asks me to do something work-wise, then I'll always say yeah. I've had some random jobs. Miranda, awesome. I mean, that's, that's what, you know, I'm, I'm all up for that. A lot of people have this downer. I think particularly when you're starting off in the industry, in the acting industry in particular, a lot of people have this thing where they're like, you know, and I see it on Facebook groups again that I hate, that I won't mention in particular groups, but you know which one I hate. It's all like, why should I work for free? Why should I work for this? Why should I not work for a million pounds? I'm an actor. It's like, get over yourself. Um, you should do it because it could be a really good experience. And if you're saying no, then you're shutting down your creativity. You're doing all those dangerous things. You're shutting down the uh, creative dialogue. You're you know, shutting down your audience. Um, and you never know where opportunities will lead you to. Don't say yes. If you've done your due diligence and you don't think it's worth your time, don't say yes. Don't take an unpaid job in, you know, and have to quit your paid job to take it. You know, don't do things that are just stupid because you go, I must do this for my craft. I have to do this for my craft, otherwise I won't be a real actor. Bullshit. We're people at the end of the day. We're not actors. People label themselves as actors like, oh, we're a different race. <laughs> we're a different species. We're so much more important than and scientists and brain surgeons and, and, uh, and doctors. You no, know, we're people, right, who get to do a job that we don't have to do. We get to do it. Uh, so don't say yes to things that, are, you know, that, that aren't going to be good for you. Do your due diligence, but don't be that devil's advocate where you just play, it, you know, play everything down and go, no, 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 no. If it's a half-baked idea, remember, that's great because a cake never gets baked until it's gone through its half-baked stage. We just read that. Um, so yeah, just be you know just just be open-minded to saying yeah more. That's it. Simple as that. I think that's it. Just be open-minded to saying yes more. Particularly if someone asks you to do something and you do feel a little bit uncomfortable, don't have that avoidance mentality that's built into your head. Remember, instantly your negativity bias is going to go. Get away from it. It's painful. Get away from it. Stop. Have a word with yourself. Go. Is it really going to be painful? And if you know you work you work out that it's not going to be that painful, go and try it. More cake analogies, please. I, I, Helen, I bloody love cake. Like, on a massive level. My favourite, before we go, nothing to do with mindset, what's your favourite cake? Mine is birthday cake with butter, just plain birthday cake with that buttercream and jam. You know what I mean? Proper birthday, I spat then. You know what I mean? Proper birthday cake. Like you have as a kid, real birthday cake. That's the best cake in the world for me. I don't think you can beat that. Followed closely by vanilla cheesecake. Quite like that. Fanny's laughing, um, but yeah, what's your favourite cake? Carrot cake, Miranda. Victor oh, Victoria Sponge, it's a classic. 
Love bit of butter cream, says Sam. I will eat it like if I ever make a cake, which is very, very rare, like for never, not for years to be honest, not since I went to school. I would eat it with, with the spoon. My mum makes a cookie cake. Well, Tony Ross is here, I didn't even know you were here, Tony. You're in America. How on earth can we ship a cookie cake over to the UK? Well, what we need to do, right, is we need a, like, we need a big party. Red velvet with cream cheese frosting, nice. Let's try and arrange through the Facebook group some kind of party for the end of this year. Red Velvet, another one for Red Velvet with Selena. And let's get do like some big, just one, we'll do it like just once a year, like a big social. And we'll try and get people from all around the world to come over. Tony Rossi, start saving up for a plane ticket, son. You're going to have super success anyway, you so you'll be loaded soon anyway. I like the cut of your jib. Um, Girly World is going to make a cake. Um, yeah, and we'll sort a day out and you can, you fly over, man. Get yourself over and then maybe we can have a trip out. We'll have a trip out to the States. I fly over to LA quite a bit now and again. I'm part of a business out there, so uh, I'm over in America a little bit, but only in uh, in LA. Um, but yeah, get yourself over and we'll just have a big cake party where everybody bakes their favourite cake. And I'm massive on coffee, you know that. So there'll be no alcohol, it's going to just be coffee and the best cake. <laughs> if you're watching this on the replay, by the way, and you came for some like mindset stuff, I'm sorry it, it's all gone to pop. Uh, but, but yeah, I love it. My 30th, end of November. Let's do something like that then. End of November's good. Good for me. Can I just buy mine from the bakery? Well, you can, Kat, because I won't be baking mine, probably, unless maybe... You see on Facebook sometimes, don't you, these cake things? Like where people like show you how to make rainbow cake and how it's all amazing. Maybe my rich girlfriend would buy me a ticket. Get her over as well, Tony, and if she's got a rich sister, bring her. <laughs> oh, God. Honestly, this country. And what we're talking about. Um, right. It's my 30th in two months as well, says Kat. Bloody hell, I'm well old. I'm like 33. Tony Rossi, how old are you? He's, must, he's in his 20s, that kid. I'm proper old. Um, but never forget this, guys, right? Helen Power's older, but Helen, you've got the power, so it's fine. Never forget this, right? I don't want anyone ever to get hung up on age, right? Just turned 28, Tony. He's just a baby. I hear a lot of people, it mm, kind of gets to me a little bit. Where people are like, oh god, yeah, I'm getting older. Oh, I hate this. Oh, you know, and they, and they they're sort of like just really bitter about it, um, and they use it as an excuse to get bitter about what they've not achieved in their life and what they've not done and how much more successful they should be by now. And what you've got to remember is just a number. And if we didn't know our ages, imagine like you know, I've got mates who are like 70, and I talk to them just the same as my mates who are 18, 19. Three years on us, totally old. I am Sam, but just remember that growing old is a privilege that so many people on this earth do not get. I've got issues with age ever since I was a kid. It's not a vanity thing since I was little. Well, embrace it. When I get another year, I love it. I'm like, yes, because you know what? I've done it. I've got to another year. One of my ultimate goals above anything in life, I mean, like, more important to me than anything acting-wise or anything like that, is to reach 100 years old. Because that in itself is a huge milestone, I think. And, it, and that, for me, is winning at life. Looking after yourself and hopefully having as, you know, good fortune enough to get to 100 years old. Tony, in the UK, when we get to 100 years old, the Queen sends us a telegram. Telegraph? Telegram? Whatever. Don't know what that is. Um, like a little card, right? Frame thing. Now, Kate Middleton, who currently isn't Queen, is beautiful. Now. I like her. <laughs> I would like her to come out of my house and deliver my telegram at 100 years old. Now, at 100 years old, she is not going to be very fit, is she? But neither am I, so it's fine. I want a telegram for the Queen. Well, you're not English, Tony. I don't think you're allowed one. But you realise when you're 100, Kate Millicent will just be as old too. Yeah, that's what I just said, Sam. I know she will, so she's not going to be the looker that she is today. But it's still a goal of mine. And I've been reading a lot of science recently as well, and not my generation, so probably not our generation, but the generation or two after us. This is quite mental and maybe a bit scary. Could be living to up to 120 years old because of advances in science and, and medical stuff. I think people like, I think there's someone already got to like 109, 110, maybe even older than that. But it won't be uncommon in a couple of generations time for people to live to 120. Uh, which is mental because the world gets overcrowded, doesn't it? Thought you were going to say come round for something else for a minute then. What? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, Cat. I can't remember what I said. Obviously, Cat's got a, a filthy mind. Um, but yeah, 
I'll try and root out some uh, OK Middleton. Whew, no, come around to just give me the give me the telegraph. A hundred years old cow. I'm sure that's not going to be on any of our minds. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Um, we are. I'm a bloke, so it's probably true. Um, but yeah, uh, 120. I don't know if the world's ready for that, or if it will ever be able to accommodate that, because we're already getting overpopulated, so that's an interesting one. I'll leave you with that thought. Anyway, um, guys, going to be back on Monday for some motivation and mind hacks, and then maybe, if I've figured out iTunes in time, so I can get a podcast published on iTunes, I'm going to start doing a podcast on a Friday, five-minute Friday, it's always going to be a five-minute motivational, inspirational piece that's going to replace Friday Book Club. It will mean we will periscope just twice a week. We'll do Monday uh, for motivation and mind hacks, and then Wednesday will be book club. Friday, you guys are going to get a podcast that you'll be able to download and listen to whenever you want. So people who can't make the book club on a Friday right now can still have something that they can get involved with on a Friday away from having to join live. Uh, so I think it's pretty cool. It's a cool idea. It's another way to expand our reach. Uh, but that will be available on iTunes and on the site, actsonlist.tv. If I can sort that out for Friday coming, then that will happen. If not, we'll be on um, three Periscopes next week, as usual. Um, I'll have a new book, but I'll let you guys know on the Facebook group. Facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash acts on this TV. Thank you so much for tuning in yet again. Um, appreciate you all. Have a fantastic Easter. Eat as much chocolate as you want. Don't feel guilty about it. Just um, make up for it next week. Okay, it's the one weekend of the year I allow myself to indulge. Well, actually, no, it's not. That's a total lie because birthday weekend and Christmas. So it's one of three. Uh, but yeah, happy Easter, says Helen. Happy Easter, everybody. Whether you are religious or whatever, whatever it means for you, just enjoy yourself. Um, and um, I'll see you guys Monday. Uh, thanks, Selena. Thank you, Kat. Happy rabbits. <laughs> okay. Um, I love rabbits. Uh, chocolate ones. I wouldn't eat a real one. Oh, I don't know. Maybe I would. I've never tried it. Uh, right. I'm going to finish the coffee off now, guys. Happy Easter, Sam. Tony. I'm sure you have Easter in America. I'm joking. I know you do. You go big for Easter in America. They put, they just go big on everything in America. Miles bare. Um, they put like things on the doors and everything, and Easter egg hunts and stuff that we just don't normally do because we're a bit lazy in the UK. Maybe we should get on it. We'll do a, a periscope Easter egg hunt. Maybe I'll do that, like a random periscope on Sunday. I don't know. Look out for it. Make sure you subscribe, and you'll get a message if I do it. Nice one, guys. I'm, I'm going. I'm going to try and end this now. Not always about the size. Now, what, what have we done here, Sam? This has gone rude again. We totally do. Happy Easter, says, uh, says Tony. But you can dress as a bunny. Love to. Um, Sam's probably thinking of Playboy bunnies or <laughs> something. Rude again. She's been on one date. She's got all rude. I think that guy knows what he's in for. Right, guys. Bye for now. See you soon. Thanks for watching. <laughs>